thought what we'd look at, the important lessons. You can sit through a whole lot of talks on techniques for fistula repair, and you know, it always sounds good when someone else just describes it. There are probably only a few basic principles that you really need to know, um, and there's no absolutely right or wrong. So I wanted to look at perhaps the mistakes that have been made and the things that we could do better. Now, because the psychovaginal fistula is much is the commonest, I thought we'd focus on this first of all. And look, it's really interesting. As we all would have said, even up to a few years ago, most of these fistulas are obstetric trauma, prolonged obstructed labour, and they're in low resource areas, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of Asia. Whereas in the high resource countries, certainly we still get the psychovaginal fistulae, but they're almost always after gynaecological surgery and benign gynaecological surgery. Now, for a good while, laparoscopic has felt to be a greater risk for the psychovaginal fistula or ureteric injuries. I think that's probably changing slightly as people just get better and better at their laparoscopic technique. But open hysterectomies, because you know it's going to be difficult, you've got no other choice how to do it, are also a common cause. And all the other factors, radiotherapy. Certainly in my population, we call radiotherapy the gift that keeps on giving. First of all, it saves you from cancer, and then it keeps giving you fistulas and bowel obstructions and all sorts of things. So they are very difficult patients to fix. Malignancy and pessaries, the forgotten pessary, particularly in the ladies who are getting a little bit forgetful. The literature would suggest that in 10 to 15% of the psychovaginal fistulae, we see some ureteric injury. I, I think that's a little bit questionable. I'm not sure it's that high, but the point is you have to go looking. So what we've had over the last couple of decades, probably a little bit more, a lot of areas of the world have had much better obstetric care. They've had access to after-hours emergency caesarean sections. Um, so the picture is changing. I have a colleague who works in Ethiopia a lot, and he said that spent it took them many, many years to get across the idea, first of all, to try and overcome some of the fear of hospitals, but they put out this mantra of never let the sun set twice on a labouring woman, and that was to try and educate people that you couldn't let the labour go on and on. There was a point at which you would intervene. And a lot of progress has been made there. So, in fact, if you look at um, VVF overall, most of them are from benign and often not very complicated gynae surgery. Now, I did find this article from a New Delhi unit, which is really interesting. They looked at five years of their psychovaginal fistulae up to 2006, and then another several years later, up to 2017, they looked at them again and compared. So even in 2006, three quarters of fistulae were obstetric in origin. In 2017, only 25%, only one quarter were obstetric in origin. The others were a combination of um, gynaecological surgery, but also caesarean section. And this is interesting. We are seeing more and more um, fistulae following caesarean section, partly because they're being done more for the obstructed labours, of course, but uh, easily probably 10%. We're also seeing more unusual fistulae, the vesicouterines, the vesicocervical fistulae, from doing a second stage caesarean section with the head well down. It, it is easy to see how that could happen. Now, you also run the risk of ureteric damage at hysterectomy, obviously, but caesarean section. The more caesarean sections you do, every time you do a caesarean section, a bit more fibrosis on the trigone of the bladder and the back of the dome, and your ureters are dragged in a little more medially each time. So sometimes you're up to caesar number four and you look, and here's this vermiculating little structure on the anterior wall of the uterus. So not hard to see if you were going in there in a hurry how you might um, cause some ureteric injury. Now, the other thing that is interesting, really interesting, is the delay in diagnosis. Now, I would have to, you think it's fairly inexcusable, don't you? Someone's had a hysterectomy and then a week or so later they come in talking about discharge or leakage or, you know, something a bit odd. And yet, on average, it takes up to eight months 
for that patient to end up at the right referral unit with the right diagnosis. And even in cases where there was a known intraoperative injury that was repaired, there is still a big delay in diagnosis. And believe me, it is not all in resource poor areas. The figure of um, five months is from a big Australian unit that has a huge um, number of fistula patients. And they still found there was a delay in diagnosis that people treated these women as having stress incontinence or an overactive bladder and didn't think about fistulae. I suspect it's more, you don't want to think about fistulae, okay? You don't want to think, what have I done? What could I possibly have done? But it probably should be the first thing you think of when you've got a patient coming back. After what you thought was straightforward, ovarian cystectomy, straightforward hysterectomy, it has to be excluded early in the piece. So the main advice is, for goodness sake, high index of suspicion. Always, always with something out of the ordinary, make sure you've ruled it out. Now, probably almost three quarters of injuries are not recognised at the time of surgery. So there's been a lot of talk about whether we should routinely do a cystoscopy after hysterectomies, after repairs, after continent surgery. And people will say, oh, look, it's not necessary. However, you will probably pick up a significant number of injuries that would otherwise go undiagnosed for a good period of time. You can do something really simple. You can retrograde fill the bladder from below, get your assistant to fill the bladder with a dilute methylene blue, and you can be looking up top through your laparoscope and see if you've got any blue dye spilling anywhere into the abdomen. Make sure you dilute it, because if it's a concentrated, everything's blue and you can't find anything. But something as simple as that takes a couple of minutes at the end of the procedure, and, you know, you will sleep better for it. Obviously, you won't detect all injuries, and we had an interesting case yesterday, didn't we, that where um, if you've got a denervation injury, an ischemic-type injury, that will not present with issues until later. And that's, <clears throat> that's hard. You've just still got to think about it. Now, lots of investigations, lots of fancy tests done with suspicion of fistulae, and, and certainly in Australia, everyone, you could turn up with a sore toe and you would get a CT scan. You know, people have forgotten how to look an X-ray. And I think it's similar problems with fistulae. Put the speculum in the vagina and have a look, OK? Now, that's a problem with a great big lady who might also have some stress incontinence or some overactivity. But at least look. Put some blue dye into the bladder. Put a catheter. Fold it into the bladder. Put in a few hundred mils of blue dye and see where it comes out in the vagina. It's actually really useful to localise where that point is in the vagina because it could be a tiny little defect. You're not going to see it easily. And it's really interesting. I had a woman once who had some mesh erosion into the vagina. And how'd it go? No, she had mesh erosion into the bladder. And I cystoscoped her and I could see it. But I wanted to know exactly where on the anterior vaginal wall that mesh was, that position was. And I had to stick a needle through a few times from the vagina before I actually got the right spot. So it can be very difficult to know exactly where that fistula is when you want to work at it from the vagina, um, if it's a particularly small one. And they can be. They can be torturous. They can be really circuitous fistulae. Now, the tampon test you probably all know about, we also used to call, call it the three swab test. So you put the blue dye in that bladder. Can't see anything, but she's giving you a good story and you're still worried. So spigot the, leave the Foley's catheter in and spigot it and blow up the balloon on the end so you're not going to get much leakage through the urethra. Pop a tampon in or some swabs in and get her to walk around for an hour or so. It's classic teaching, okay? If you get some blue right at the bottom, at the, vagina, at the um, vulval aspect, that's leaked from the, from the bladder probably, right? It, could be more complex. But if you've got blue dye on it, you've got a psychofistula, vesicle fistula from somewhere, okay? If it's got blue dyes on your tampon, it could only have come out of the bladder. Now, if the top of your tampon is wet and it's clear, so it's wet, but it's clear, it hasn't come from the bladder, but it's come from somewhere, that's when you go thinking, oh, I've really done it now. I've got the ureter, all right? And that's when you can start looking at various imaging things to see, 
exactly what you've done and how bad it is and, you know, you try and find your friendly urologist to give them a call so they won't be too critical. But really, that's about all you need to do to start with. Unless you're very suspicious of some coexisting ureteric injury, a whole lot of imaging isn't a big help um, if you need to, if you're worried, obviously. And neurodynamics, what are you? I suppose the only thing neurodynamics would tell you before you repair a fistula that might be useful is if that patient has an overactive bladder or pre-existing overactivity, pre-existing stress incontinence, at least your fistula repair can't be blamed for that. And you can prepare her for the fact that there is still going to be leakage, but it's leakage for a different reason. So I can see some justification there, but in terms of making your diagnosis, don't bother. You know, if you've got a big hole and blue dye pouring out your vagina, you know what's happened and what you need to do. In terms of management, look, not many of us do enough of these to be really good at it. And I think swallow your pride, refer to a colleague you trust, someone you know will look after that lady well and you can promise her that. So if it's not something you do a lot of, don't try. Because failed attempts make it harder and harder. Your best results are with the first repair, like everything in life. And repeated redos and trying to repair it are much worse. You will read, peop and people write up case reports of, oh, I just, it was a tiny little fistula, so I went into the bladder, did a spot of diathermy, and gave her a catheter for a week or two, and it healed. Yeah, well, maybe once a blue moon. I wouldn't rely on that as a technique. It's the same as people find, endlessly finding uses for that platelet-rich plasma. What a con that is. Anyway, so they inject it with platelet-rich plasma and put the catheter in. Now, if that heals, it only heals because the bladder's been drained over that time. I would be very careful with those sort of techniques. All you're really doing is giving that lady another two or three weeks of drainage of a catheter 24 hours a day before you get round to doing anything about it. So if she's anxious, yeah, you might talk with her about that possibility. Let's, let's do the um, drainage for a while and see what happens. But really, don't kid yourself. Most of the time, you need to operate. And in terms of, again, we had a good case with this yesterday. Is it abdominal? Is it vaginal? The rule of thumb I use is if I can see it, and I can reach it, I will do it vaginally. But if you've had a lot of other surgical problems abdominally, it's a high fistula, it's after caesarean section, so it was originally an abdominal approach, yes, there can be a time when you need to do that. But, you know, urologists have always repaired things abdominally that we would do vaginally in the blink of an eye. So you judge that and think, look, I can reach it. It's not under tension. I can suture that. I can work on that area and, and go vaginally. The results, look, it's not fair to say the results are better. The results are better because it was probably a, simple, a more simple fistula if you managed to repair it vaginally. But you don't automatically think abdominal. Again, there was all sorts of talk about not operating for months until all the inflammation and the infection had settled down. I suspect the inflammation won't completely settle in quite a long time, but is that a reason not to operate? Right? If it's frankly infected, if it's sluffy tissue, sure, you might need to wait because it's so hard to repair when it's all necrotic. But anything less than that, you're just giving her longer t with the catheter drainage. Right? She's going to have a good couple of weeks afterwards anyway. So. I even had a colleague who was very famous who wouldn't repair a fistula when a lady was having a period because he thought everything was too vascular. Well, I'd have to say, if I was trying to repair a fistula, I would like it fairly vascular. I think that might help our healing. So, you know, those sort of things aren't a reason either. And I don't know about you guys, I can never tee up an operation when someone has or doesn't have a period. It just doesn't work, does it? Something always mucks up the system. So I think the only thing is frank infection, necrotic tissue, sure, you may have to wait. But otherwise, get on with it. Antibiotics, <laughs> yeah, they make you feel better, don't they? They make you feel you're doing something. Do you need antibiotics for the whole time that catheter's draining? Probably not. You need antibiotics around the time of your surgery. You'll almost certainly get an infection in a two, three, four week catheter drainage period. I'm not sure that that, just because getting a urinary tract infection, I don't think that compromises your repair, particularly if she becomes very symptomatic. Yes, I would give her some more antibiotics, but you don't need to keep it going the whole time.
The other thing that we have learned debates about is whether you should have a suprapubic catheter and a urethral catheter in case one gets blocked or dislodged. Quite honestly, they are the most miserable patients with a catheter in the urethra and one in the belly and they all get tangled up. I'm not sure that there's any real advantage in that. Perhaps if you had appalling tissues and you were petrified of, of getting any obstruction in the bladder filling up, do both of them. But quite honestly, a decent gauge, 14 French, 16 French if you have two Foley's. Remember you need a long-term urethral catheter because the regular Foley's do get pretty mucky by about a week. So either use a silicon or the hydrogel coated. Do you have the hydrogel coated Foley's? They're a nice compromise because they're fairly soft. Silicon catheters are a bit rigid and by the time you've walked around with it through your urethra and taped your leg, weeks on end, you're pretty uncomfortable. And when the patients get uncomfortable, they nag you, they demand you to do something. You know, you, you can't manage them as you would. I was interested yesterday to talk to people. We tend to go 10 to 14 days. You might go a bit longer if it was a really difficult repair. But I think different areas, the time to drainage is longer. We would do a cystogram before you take it out for medico-legal reasons. Every now and then someone isn't healed and you need longer drainage. You start to feel very negative if it hasn't healed by a couple of weeks. The prognosis is not good, but it's worth giving it a little bit longer. The one trap with the cystograms is that the, they're done often by the radiologist. You've got to make sure you're there because they do things like put 50 mils of contrast in because, you know, they're scared of doing some damage and radiologists have completely forgotten how to do things like catheters. And they'll say, oh, it's fine. You put two or three hundred in, it may not be fine at all. So make sure there's a decent amount in the bladder. Now, look, as I, I do apologise. I'm sure you've done endlessly more fistically than I have, but that's if we take that wisdom from around the world, it's probably some sensible advice in what, you know, to do or not to do. So thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would like a token of our deepest appreciation and gratitude to be presented to Dr. Jennifer. Ma'am, we simply cannot thank you enough. And please, I... Somehow can you make this an annual thing? Maybe visit us every year. <laughs>